Hi everyone, we are moving right along. Now we will turn our attention to a discussion of contract law, which will take us through the last of the modules up and through the midterm examination. We start with chapter 10, and chapter 10 gives you the basic outlines of what is included in contract law. Contract law deals with disputes between uh, two private parties. Actually, they're not always disputes. Contracts are agreements between two private parties or two or more private parties. And uh, when we read about these cases in our textbooks, these are all the cases where contracts go wrong. We read about these so that we can learn about what happened and why people feel the need to sue and in order to recover um, for uh, wrongs that they feel were committed. But the vast majority of contracts take place without a hitch. We make contracts all the time. You go to the doctor, you don't say, doctor, I will agree to um, pay you $100 for your services if you agree to fix my broken arm. We don't talk like that, we don't act like that, but all day long we are making contracts without even thinking about it. Most contracts are oral, uh, many of them are anyway, um, and uh, most contracts can be enforced even if they are oral. Uh, there are only five types of contracts that have to be in writing to be enforceable. We will talk about those shortly. In Chapter 10, uh, they um, bring up the subject of the Common Law of Contracts versus the Uniform Commercial Code, otherwise known as the UCC. It's important to understand what that is as you get started because um, for purposes of our discussion um, and our focus of these, these few chapters together, we look at the Common Law of Contracts. The UCC is uh, based on the Common Law of Contracts, so many of the rules are very similar. But there, it's, it's a whole different body of the law. It's a codified law, which means it's statutory in nature. The UCC uh, is, has been uh, passed in many states and uh, enacted in order to make um, contract disputes um, it helps to promote contract formation, let's just say it that way, and makes um, uh, a little bit easier in the marketplace to have the free exchange of uh, goods and money and things of that nature. We, as a, a society, we do business all day long, all the time. If every person who had a small dispute uh, in terms of business or in terms of um, you know goods and uh, if we sued over every single little thing like that courts would just be bombarded so the UCC was uh, passed after the common law of contracts obviously was in existence and it was meant to help free up the marketplace so that uh, we have um, a little bit of an easier time promoting and having contracts entered into and uh, fixed if something goes wrong so, goods are described as anything that is tangible, movable, and personal property. This excludes, by definition, real property, which is real estate, your house, your, uh, your land. So, it's real estate and anything permanently attached to the realty. That would not be covered under the UCC. But anything that's tangible, which means you can hold it or feel it with your hands, movable, you can pick it up and move it from place to place, and personal property as opposed to real estate, all of that falls under the Uniform Commercial Code. Um, so we will, uh, you know, think about that a little bit later in the course. But first, we have we studied the Common Law of Contracts so we can have an understanding what is involved in contract law, and also we have a better understanding of what the UCC is all about when we get to that point and we study it. In Chapter Ten, we also talk about different categories categories of contracts. We talk about Univer I can't speak tonight, I'm sorry. We talk about bilateral versus unilateral contracts. A bilateral contract is one where one party is making an agreement or a promise and is seeking a return promise. I promise to pay you $100 if you promise to sell me your coat. That's asking for a return promise, not an act. I promise to pay you $100 if you plow out my driveway. Okay, that is asking for an act back. The uniform, um, the unilateral contract is a promise for an act, and um, performance of the act completes that contract. Whereas the other one, a bilateral contract, is a promise for a promise. Not a big deal for you to know that, but I just wanted to explain it in case you read it and weren't quite sure what that was all about. We also have contracts that are sometimes implied in law, and what that means is that the court will imply the existence of a contract where a true contract was not met because it would it would actually work to serve a great injustice to one of the parties. So if you were promised a job and you um, said, okay, I accept it, 
and for some reason it didn't get put into writing. The job offer didn't get put into writing, so there was a fatal uh, error in the contract formation. Um, then um, you picked up, you sold your house, you sold your car, you moved three states away in reliance on the, upon the offer. Uh, sometimes a court might say, you know what, uh, you know, the employer, you knew she was going to do this. She did do this. She incurred a great, in, you know, expense to do that and, um, you know, really has nothing to go back to. So they may imply the existence of that contract in law, though technically um, the contract elements were not met. The other parts uh, that you ways that you can categorize contracts are as um, executory versus executed. Executory means that it has not been completed yet. Uh, the parties are still working through. Payment has not been made, and maybe the other party has not performed. That's still executory, but once payment is made and performance is complete, we call it an executed contract. And we also distinguish them between valid, void, and voidable. A valid contract is one where the elements of the contract have been met. There are no valid defenses or other challenges to contract formation, um, and uh, it's enforceable. A contract that is void is the opposite. It's unenforceable because it is either against the law or um, there is a huge problem with contract formation. And a voidable one is one where one of the parties um, has a special right associated with it and has the option of enforcing it or getting out of the contract. So those are your ways of categorizing contracts. In Chapter 11, we look at the first two required elements to have a valid contract, and those are the offer and the acceptance. Notice when you look at the terminology and you look at the different requirements for a contract, we have offer, acceptance, consideration, capacity, legality. Those are your uh, requirements for a valid contract. Each one of those has its own requirements underneath that. So although I know that the offer is the first required element in a contract, the offer has three separate requirements in order for you to make sure it's valid. It has to be a present serious intention to be bound in contract. You can't be joking. You can't be saying, in the future, I might want to do this. You have to have a present serious intention today to be bound by that contract. You have to have definite terms. You can't have uh, the terms not be so, uh, the terms can't be so indefinite that a court cannot give a remedy for breach of contract. They can't figure out exactly what. Uh, if you said some of my paintings or something like that, for example, that would not be definite enough. The court could never enforce um, you know, a, a, a remedy for one of the parties in there. The last term of the offer is that it is communicated to the offeree. So if you have a letter making an offer, it's sitting on your desk, and you never end up sending that to the offer, the offeree, uh, then you don't have um, that term of the, the required element of um, an offer met, and therefore you can't have a valid contract if you don't first have a valid offer. For it, uh, an acceptance to be valid, you have to make sure that the acceptance mirrors the offer. What that means, and you'll see in your reading something called the mirror image rule, and what that means is you have to have uh, an acceptance on the terms of the offer as the offer was stated. If you change any of the terms, then that actually operates as a counter offer. So if I said to you, I'll sell you my coat if you pay me $100, and you say to me, um, I would love to buy your coat, but I'm only going to be able to pay you $80 for that. What you did was um, you rejected the original offer, and now you have made a new offer. So the parties switch roles. I originally was the offeror, and you were the offeree. By rejecting my offer and coming up with a new offer, $80 instead of 100 you have taken the place of the offeror, and I am now the offeree. I am free to accept your offer on your terms, or I can reject it. Um, what you did was uh, created a counter offer. That's what they, we call that. When you terminate and then you create a new offer, we call that a counter offer. Um, the offer and the acceptance also, in, in addition to mirroring the offer, has to be voluntary. And an involuntary offer obviously uh, does not have any type of genuine assent to it. So if someone's holding a gun up to your head saying, sign over the deed to your house or I'm going to kill you, obviously you are not voluntarily agreeing to uh, to sign the deed over to your house. Uh, and that's invalid for many other reasons as well, but those are um, the basic points there. 
the rest of that chapter on chapter 11 deals with um, the specific and unique distinctions um, for online contracts. And we did talk about that on the discussion board for an entire week. So I don't feel that we need to kind of go through that again here in any great detail. But understand that online contracts, online offers are valid. Um, and we have the e-signature act and can operate as a valid acceptance that way. And there's some really great information in that part of Chapter 11, so I hope that you appreciated that. And if you have any questions on it, please let me know. The last chapter that we talk about for um, this module, Module 4, is Chapter 12. And Chapter 12 is all about consideration. Um, the word is kind of strange in terms of we think of consideration as being nice to someone, but consideration in contract law means that you are giving something of legal value to support uh, the contract. Um, consideration has two parts to it. Consideration has bargained for exchange, that's the first part, and the second part is that what you are uh, uh, giving up has legal value, and legal value is value in the eyes of the law. And I always like to use an example like lint from my dryer really has no value. You know, feel bad for saying it, but my lint is really like worthless. But if it were the lint from um, J-Lo, if J-Lo's uh, lint came out of her dryer and some, you know, somebody might pay money for that, right? So that would be something that might have value in the eyes of the law. So that's legal value. But the thing that makes a contract uh, a contract is the bargaining part of consideration. A gift shares a lot of similarities with um, contract law, but a gift is not a contract because there is no bargaining involved. If you give me your coat, um, you know, you are, you know, showing a present intention to give it away and, and um, we know exactly what it is. But a gift is not a contract because we have not bargained back and forth uh, in order for me to get that coat and keep it. You've just simply said, I want you to have this. Here you go. So you have donative intent and you have present delivery of that, but there is no bargaining back and forth. Well, you know, if you wash my car for me, I'll give you my coat. Now we're into the contract law type of a uh, feel. That bargaining aspect uh, is really, really super important. In Chapter 12, you'll see that there are certain types of um, um, situations that actually don't qualify uh, as adequate consideration. We, we call it adequate and sufficient. Don't worry about the distinction between those for purposes of our class. Um, but a consideration has to be adequate and it has to be sufficient in order to be the type of um, consideration to support a contract. A lot of times it's goods or services on one side and money on the other. It's really not a big question. But there are some times where uh, we have things that come up that uh, we ask whether these will be sufficient uh, to qualify as consideration to support a contract. Under the pre-existing duty rule, for example, uh, if you are under um, a duty to do something already, um, and then you um, uh, use that to support a contract, that's not okay. It's not adequate or sufficient consideration to support the contract. So if you are um, um, duty bound, for example, as a night security, as a police officer to uh, apprehend suspects and there's a report of a crime, there's been some stolen jewelry, and at night you work in moonlighting as a security guard, and while you are in that employment, that sec second job, uh, you discover the jewelry that's been, um, you know, lost in the crime. If you try to claim the reward for that, um, the uh, the reward is not yours and is not uh, payable. The reason is that there was a pre-existing duty. You were under contract, paid in to investigate and find and discover this before. So you cannot use that um, to support a contract. Um, we also have something called past consideration. Past consideration means that um, you did not have a present serious intention to be bound. Um, I'm sorry, that, uh, that you are not making your, um, your bargaining right now. That's what I meant to say. I'm sorry. Um, the bargaining happened in the past and um, or uh, the agreement happened and then you're trying to use it after the fact. Let me give you an example because I'm not actually expressing that the way that I want to express it. Suppose uh, my car breaks down and it's really snowy. Uh, big surprise here in New England. We have uh, a snowstorm going on right now outside. 
um, and I can't get home. So I knock on some person's door and they're kind enough to let me stay overnight until the plows can come and I can get my car out and drive home. The following day after I get home or the next day after that, I go back to them and I say, thank you so much for helping me out. Um, you know, I'm going to send you a check for $300 for your kindness. I really appreciate that. And if then after that I don't send the check for $300, they may try to sue me for breach of contract. Would they be successful? And the answer is no. Um, maybe moral obligation, maybe past consideration. I said this to them after. I didn't go up to the door and I'd say to them, you know, if you let me stay here overnight, I will pay you $300 for that. That would be bargaining. And that's what's critical for you to see and recognize in consideration or for purposes of understanding what consideration is. Was there bargaining? And in my example, no, there wasn't. They were just being kind, right? And so the next next day, uh, you know, when I don't go through with my, my deal, they really don't have any recourse after that. Um, the bargaining has to happen at the time. The last one that they mention in your reading is about illusory promises. Um, you know, uh, sometimes we, we call these uh, for output and requirement contracts. I agree to buy all of the widgets that you manufacture. Well, what if you manufacture no widgets? I'm really agreeing to absolutely nothing. Um, or I will agree to uh, sell you everything that I manufacture and every tennis shoe that I manufacture. I may sell or manufacture absolutely no tennis shoes. So in that case, again, it's illusory. And so that's not sufficient consideration to support a contract as well. And that's the material from chapters 10, 11, and 12 on to module 5.